Good evening. I want to welcome everybody that's watching online for the men's ministry meeting on this Thursday night in May 2020, right in the middle of this pandemic that's going on. Um, it's forced us to renegotiate how we communicate with one another and the way that we project uh, our fellowship, the way that we commune together. So in light of that, uh, we're doing live stream only men's meeting tonight. And there are, I know right now, literally people all over watching us either on Facebook or YouTube or our website. And in fact, I would encourage you, if that's where you're watching any of those platforms, that you would uh, be included in the chat. Go ahead on Facebook beneath the video. There's a place where you can communicate with us. Say hi. Let us know that you're there. Maybe where you're watching from. Uh, same thing on the website. It's to the right of the video. And you can uh, let us know there. Kind of click on the chat button and all the information's there. Uh, you can take notes there. And then uh, YouTube, same thing. And then also, if for any reason you have not downloaded the Bible app or Church Center app, I would encourage you to do that. And if you download the Bible app and you click on that right now and then select more and events, find the Rock of Central Florida and everything for the notes tonight will be there and you can save those for yourself for review. You can come back to it later. And also on the Church Center app, you can check in. So if you're watching right now, wherever you're watching from, please do me a favor and get on the Church Center app on your, tele your phone, your smartphone, your iPad, whatever it is, and check in so that we know that you are here. Before we do anything else, uh, it is a joy today to again gather with you uh, wherever you are, whatever the distance is. Uh, we can feel as close as we want to, uh, but I want to pray, and I want to start this evening right by allowing Holy Spirit to do everything that He wants to do among us. So Father, I lift my voice over my son who has joined me tonight and all of those who are watching online tonight from wherever they are. And I pray, Father, for every man, every person that is a witness to what you are going to release to us tonight about the relationship of fathers and sons. And I pray that you will help us uh, to receive from what is being said, help us to uh, make a draw and to be changed by it. So that the end of this 30 minutes or 40 minutes, whatever it is, uh, your word has been released in such a way that every hearer has been changed. And let it be to your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So I want to do this. I want to play a quick video uh, Cody Hebner did for us. He does most of our media here at the Rock of Central Florida. Does a great job. I uh, loves it. And he had something to say about men's ministry. And I want you to hear what he had to say. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Cody Hebner, and this is the Rock of Central Florida's men's ministry meeting. Why is men's ministry important? Well, I can tell you why I believe it is. It's because of all of the differing perspectives that are brought to the table. I think every single meeting that I've been a part of, my mind has been blown multiple times. It's just incredible because it can be about something you would never even think about. And then bam, people are dropping bombs left and right. And it's like, what? This is, what? How did I not think of it this way? So it just that, that, that constant iron sharpening iron causing you to grow, causing your perspective to expand is such a great aspect of this group. Cody, thank you so much. I appreciate those words, and I hope that all the men that are listening today will uh, be reminded of the significance of the time that we gather, uh, all of the men, when we can draw from one another and have that kind of fellowship. And iron does sharpen iron. And uh, so today... Leading into this, uh, the message that I want to release to you tonight is the fading father, the fading father. And I'm going to ask you a question, simple question, but where have all the fathers gone? And are fathers still relevant in the current culture where everything is about me? Are fathers still relevant in this current culture that we have that's pervasive all over, uh, is are they relevant and uh, because everything is about me 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 and there's a lost uh, respect there's a lost 
perception of what the generation in front of us can really add to us. So I want to address some of this tonight, and I want to begin by introducing to you uh, my son. This is Joshua Parker, and he is going to be uh, helping me tonight as we minister to you. And so, son, uh, welcome. It's good to have you. Would you greet, greet the men? How's it going, guys? I hope everybody's doing well and staying healthy, and uh, I'm excited for tonight. He is, he is my uh, a son in whom I'm well pleased, and he is the second son to my wife and me. We have four children, if you did not know that, um, three that are with us and one that is with the father. Uh, we had a son in, that went to be with the father in 1995, but he is still very much a part of our lives. Uh, and this is my living son that is with us today, and it's a joy, son, to have you, and, and I just really appreciate you coming uh, to help me to do this. So I want to read this evening uh, out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 in the English Standard Version, a very, very familiar verse, but it says this. It says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. This is Jesus talking. Again, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. In most cases, it's certainly it is safe to say that no one knows their Father better than that Father's children. Uh, I think that would almost always be true. Um, there's no one that knows me better than the kids that I've raised with my wife in my home, and they see me every day, they eat with me every day, we talk on the phone every day, and none of them live in my home, and yet all of them know me better than anybody does. So I think that's a pretty safe statement that where a father is present, no one knows him better than the children uh, that have grown up around him. So the statement that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 11 to religious leaders frustrated them, in fact angered them, because of his claim to know his father, that he knew his father better than they did. It really angered them, and it's an interesting point that we're going to come back to. And then also, Jesus put these religious folks in their place by letting them know that they don't know the Father, and in the end, it is what the, or they don't know Christ, and in the end, it's what the Father believes about Jesus that matters the most. In other words, he was letting them know, I don't care what you think about me, because my confidence isn't drawn out of what my neighbor thinks about me. My confidence isn't drawn, my stability, my faith, my person is not developed or shaped based on my school peers, based on my friends down the road or enemies down the road. My confidence was developed in me because my dad knows who I am. So I want to address these points today as it relates to our current generation. Uh, and in order to do that, again, I'm going to be asking my son, son some questions so that we can kind of dialogue back and forth, one, how he feels about what Jesus said, and then two, how he feels about some of the ways that me, as his daddy, uh, raised him. And before we get there, I want to point out four things I'm going to speak to in this. First, God handed over all things to the Son. This is what Matthew 11 verse 27 says. But I want to make sure that you and I understand what handed over actually means. The original word, Greek word, for that word handed is paradothi, which means it was delivered. Something was delivered. So it would be more appropriate to read this as God delivered all things to His Son. How incredible is that? That God delivered all things to His Son. How incredible is it to consider that this dad would deliver all things 
to his son. But there was a journey there, so I want to cover that in a moment. Second, no one knows the son like a father does. No one knows the son like a father. Third, no one knows the father like a son. And then fourth, the son... This is really cool. You've got to get what I'm about to say because this is a really amazing, amazing statement. When, when you consider the depth of this, number four, the son chooses those who will have access to their father. Get that. The son gets to choose who has access to the father. He gets to choose that because the Father trusts Him to protect and provide for and to minister to Him as the child begins to grow. Man, we're going to come back to that, and that is a very, very powerful statement, and I really want you to get that before we're finished today. So let's jump into the questions. So, what do these things mean to you that Jesus said about His relationship between Him and in God. So son, let me ask you three things, and I want you to simply address those three things. And What do they mean to you, these statements included in Matthew 11 that Jesus said about his father? He said, all things were delivered to him by the father. Jesus said, everything I have, my father delivered to me. What does it, when you hear that what, does that, what does that sound like to you? What, what, what kind of relationship must they have had in order for the father to say, here? Well, if you look at it naturally, I mean, people will see the father and give them the responsibility to uh, equip their sons and even their daughters, uh, but in this sense, their son. Um, so, and I believe that's the responsibility of a father is to equip their offspring with uh, whatever they have learned in their life, uh, because without that, then we're not going to advance, and there's no knowledge coming from, you know, anything. So, it's good. That's what I would say, in a natural sense, that's really good. And I li also like what you said um, when you correlated daughters too. And when I talk about sons, it's a good point that he makes because sonship isn't about boys, and it isn't about girl uh, men. It's about obedience it's about a child that is obedient in this case Matthew 11 we're talking about Jesus but in this generation we're talking about boys and girls men and women that properly position themselves in relationship with their fathers and with their mothers well well said good point another thing what do you think about um, the statement that he made to the religious group and he, they said listen uh, you don't know me you think you do but you don't know me because only the Father knows me. You judge me based on what you see, but really, only my daddy knows me. What, does, what, what is, does that statement carry when you think about it? Only the Father knows the Son. Uh, again, back to a natural example. Um, biologically speaking, uh, the traits of the Father will, without question and without you know, decision, will be inherited into the Son. Um, things that, you know, you may think your friends know you or you may think your outside family know you, but truly uh, the traits that you have that were instilled in you by the father, biologically, the father will know, but nobody else will, but you and the father. Well, wow, that's good. And what about this? He said only, this is one of my favorite parts of that whole scripture because it says, it just ha it includes so much. He said only those that the sons choose can have access to the father how what does that mean and how does a, fa a son go about choosing who will have access in a natural sense in the or, natural sense um, or even spiritually either way in a natural sense I'm not sure uh, I mean I'm sure I'll come to it in a second but uh, spiritually if you look at Jesus and the Father, Jesus is the bridge to the Father. And let's say that nobody can swim, so you can't just swim in the water across the bridge. You have to go <laughs> over the bridge. Uh, so without that, you, you know, there's no ability for that contact. Um, but naturally, that's tough. I don't really, I don't really know other than uh, the Son is the legacy. Therefore, he will meet newer people and, 
you know, decide who gets to meet his father and who doesn't. And again, in a natural sense, whoever meets your parents is of high importance um, to you. So I don't know. I guess I'd have to ponder that I think that it more. kind of flips. I think that's right. But I think it also kind of flips because as, as in, in your case and in the girl's case, Kaylee and Alex's case, as you guys were growing up, your mother and I, we would um, be careful. We would choose who had access to our children. And we would also choose who our children had access to. Um, people may invite them over to their house and we would say, well, you know, that's nice. Thank you for the invitation, but um, it's just not going to work out this weekend. Didn't have to tell them why, but uh, it wasn't a house that we wanted them to have access to. And then other times people might want to come over and spend time with our children and we would very kindly, uh, courteously, say, uh, probably not this time, it's not a good time, because again, we're choosing who has access. But then the children begin to grow, and they begin to get, become more mature. The father begins to trust them more. So instead of the father having to stand at the door and decide who comes in, the children begin to uh, share in that responsibility because they've observed the father as he has grown up, as they, as they have grown up. And now they begin to be aware of, man, um, you know, my dad wouldn't allow this person to have access, and I'm not going to allow this, these, this situation to have access to them. In fact, in John chapter 15, verse 16, put that slide up if you would, it, read, it says this, part of that scripture, very incredible part of that scripture. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but instead I chose you. And again, going back to Matthew 11, Jesus said the son gets to choose who has access to the father. And he said in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you. From the beginning of time, I chose you so that you could have access to the father. But the critical part of this is the access to his daddy came only through the son. You can only have access to my daddy by going through me. In other words, I am my father's foreguard. I am his protection. I am going to make sure that what comes to him has been prepared to properly receive him. My father has positioned himself in respect and in honor in such a way that I can stand before him and I can prepare the way for him. And that's what Jesus was saying. And in every way... We have that same responsibility. So, son, let me ask you this. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to be the Son of God? Um, not all the time. Uh, practically, no. Uh, spiritually, yes. Because I see Jesus in percentages. I see 75% spirit-led and 25% natural because, again, he was wrapped in flesh. Um, hmm, that's good but point. I don't think that... When, you know, God came up with the idea of crucifying him and, and him sacrificing himself for the people, I don't think that was easy. No. Uh, practically, I don't think anybody's brain could even, you know, think to jump for that, you know, and actually want to, you know, do that. Um, no one got up and was looking forward to going to the cross. No, nobody right. wants to have their, you know, hands nailed to two by four. Um, but I think spiritually, because Jesus was so spirit-led... In the battle between the flesh and the spirit, the spirit won the battle. Um, I think the spirit was willing, the flesh was not. Granted, we don't know, we're not in Jesus' head, but, you know, my opinion, I think that that battle, the spirit, obviously won in the end. I think you're exactly right, because when he was standing in the garden, he said, it's not my, if, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So, uh, you're exactly right. That 25% of him that was flesh was saying wow this is about to hurt uh, this is really not going to be pain free there there are no meds for this um, they can't give me any any shots of, of, uh, uh, of uh, whatever uh, might make it make the pain go away it was raw and that 25 percent of him did not look forward to it nevertheless again he says not my will but my father's will be done so that's the spiritual side, but on the natural side, um, let me ask you about us. Has it always been easy being my son? No, but I don't think it should be. 
I don't think any beneficial father-son relationships should come from an easy road. Um, because me being an athlete and someone who likes to work out and, and is big in health, nothing comes easy in that regard. Um, you have to fight to, to grow. You have to fight to become better. Um, and I think if, for example, your father-son relationship was like a father-mother relationship, there would be no maturing um, mm. through the years. Because again, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But, you know, I guess. Did you ever feel close to being killed? <laughs> no. <laughs> but, no. no. And I just want to say, by the way, 22 years. When I was 22, I want to believe that I looked like that. That's what I want to believe. Um, I know none of you right now believe that. But um, let me put my chest out and my shoulders back for just a second. So it wasn't uh, always easy for him to be my son. And neither was it always easy for me to be his father. And I think sometimes that is lost. And it's not because he was a bad son. He was an amazing son all of his life. He's been an amazing son. But I was a father in training. I was trying to figure out how do I raise this little bundle of flesh that weighed seven pounds? Uh, how do I raise this little seven pound bundle of flesh into the kind of man I believe that God intended him to be when he said, Steve, I'm giving, I'm giving this seed to you and I want you to nurture it and I want you to nurture it well. So um, it wasn't easy. That part wasn't easy. But relying and trusting on Holy Spirit and being obedient to the things I heard the Father say to me in relationship to raising my children really helped me to be able to have the confidence, you know what, I might not do it all right. It might not be all right in the sense of the best way, but it's the only way I know how. And in that, the Father's going to honor that. So uh, with that, again, I want to add to that the same thing that Jesus said in John 15, 16. He said to those gathered, He said, You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I can look at you today, and if Alex and Kaylee were sitting at this table with, them, with us, I could say to them, You did not choose your mother and me, but we chose you. None of you were here by accident. But every single one of you, we chose you. And when we chose you, it's, it's true, we didn't understand how much responsibility was going to be involved. We knew it was going to be a lot. But our mind did not have the capacity to understand the measure and magnitude of responsibility and patience uh, and endurance that it was going to take to raise up three children that love God with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind. Um, so with that, son, in the, in the efforts that I poured into you and your mother poured into you, what we've done in you, let me ask you this. What is one of the most, in your mind, and I'm putting you on the spot, and this is raw, and I get it, but what is one of the most significant impacts that as your father I have made in your life? Uh, going back to the equipping, um, the things you've equipped me with, such as, you know, to never settle. You know, that's something that you've said all, you know, me and Kaylee and Alex's lives is just to never settle uh, in anything, even relationships, that you always look forward, always look for better, um, and never quit. I was never allowed to quit. If I ever played a sport that I didn't like, and I was having a hard time, I, w I never had the option to quit. Um, even if I wanted to, if I were to bring it up to, you know, my dad, I wasn't allowed to because he was teaching me and instilling into me that, you know, once you start something, finish it through. Um, and I think that's it. It's just a never quit mentality, never settle mentality, um, and a hardworking mentality. So, and also to love the Father, but that's a given. And how, how has that impact uh, influenced, if there's a way to put it in present perspective, how has that impacted and influenced how you live today and the decisions you make when you get up this morning and tomorrow morning? I mean, it just it keeps me going. You know, if I get knocked down, I'm, I'll get right back up again. Um, if I'm discouraged, I'll think of those words and I'll keep going. Um, there's not much that will keep me from once my head is set to do something or my mind is ready to go, nothing will get in my way. Um, it doesn't matter what you throw at me, what anybody throws at me, I'm going to do what I am set out to do. So. 
and, and now um, he's going to make me cry um, because I love my kids and to know that your, your influence has really impacted them and they remember things that you've always said really does, uh, really does matter and make it all worth it. One of the things that I've, we've said to the kids for a long time is a simple statement but such a true statement that Joshua was re reflecting on and that is find easy and step over it. Whatever is easy don't hang out on the wrong side of easy. Step over it and get to the other side that's going to actually cost you something to do it. Um, and they live that and they demonstrate that. Uh, so this is a tough question. This one that, um, I, I, I say it's tough, um, maybe it's not. But I want to ask you this question in relationship of fading fathers because this applies because the whole context men that I want to speak to you today is the idea that fathers are fading in our culture today and have become less relevant and important today than they've ever been. We cannot let that be our story because I'm, I'm hoping that as you listen tonight, not only are you recognizing the impact that our Heavenly Father had on His Son Jesus Christ, but that you're also recognizing the impact that Steve Parker is having on his children and I hope that you are having on yours if you don't have them that you will and that you also understand the impact that they will have on you so I'm going to ask you this question and um, when I ask you this um, there's never a wrong answer but in a real way uh, certainly my kingdom is not like the father's kingdom but let me just ask the question. Do you feel trusted enough by me? Do you feel that I trust you enough to give you the keys to the kingdom that God has given to me? Yes, 100%. What makes you believe that I trust you? What have I said or done that gives you the confidence that I trust you enough to hand you the keys? Uh, allowing me to, I don't know, um, allowing me to have responsibility in my own life, uh, have responsibility with this uh, establishment, this church, I guess. Um, you know, just trust me to do things for you, um, no matter what it is, you know, and you're always telling me and my sisters that you're proud of us and you know you see you're proud of the people that we were becoming um, but more than anything just you know you would you trust me to do anything for you if I were to say let me do this for you instead of you doing it you would allow me to do it and I think that that's your answer that is that's the truth and and if yeah, I, I def I trust you definitely pick up the pine cones in the yard it's amazing that's <laughs> but I do son that was that was right exactly right so, and I do. I don't know a way to say it otherwise, but there is nothing that I possess that I would not trust in your hands. There is nothing the Father has laid upon me that I would be afraid for one second to put in your hands. Even if you would not and this is where it's hard, fathers. This is where it's hard sometimes because if we're not careful, the Father gives us keys to the kingdom that we rule over. Our home, our houses, our lives, livelihoods. And this is the hard part, is getting past just trusting the one I'm going to give the keys to. Getting past that and being able to trust that even if they do not use the keys the same way I do, it's wonderful. It's okay. We have to trust them with the keys that we give them to become their keys. As we raised our children, we always said to them, the day will come. He will no longer be mom and daddy's God to you. He'll be your God. He's not going to be dad's God. He's not going to be mom's God but He's going to be your God. 
And you will serve Him because you have relationship with Him with or without mom and dad. You have relationship with Him because He has shown Himself faithful to you and you love Him with everything that is in you. Jesus said that it is His will to do the will of His Father. Last couple of questions that I want to ask. What was so special about Jesus' relationship with His Father that He was willing to do His will no matter what it cost Him? What was so special about the relationship? That made Him say, not my will. Father, I'm in the garden. I'm about to go to the cross. This is not good. We, had, we talked about it just for a minute earlier. But what was so special about that relationship that He said, it's not my will, but it is your will that is done? I mean, I think he saw the power of the Father, um, and the Father allowed Jesus to see his power. Woo, um, that is a strong statement. Go ahead. And that, with that, respect came, um, and even maybe a fear. So I guess that would be your answer, is he allowed, you know, he allowed Jesus to see his power, and from there Jesus was like, okay, you know, you know I'm, I'm under your influence, so... And that relationship had been tested. It was, it was over and over again. I, recently I watched a show called The Chosen, and, and one of the scenes that I love, I think my favorite scene in all of that series, The Chosen, was when Jesus, the first miracle at the wedding in Cana, and He leaned over on that pot of water that was about to become wine, and they had run out of wine. And He put His hands on that pot, and he simply said, Father, I'm ready. Father, I'm ready. And the Father confirmed his readiness by granting to the Son the desire of his heart. Wow. I mean, it's incredible when you again think of the giving, the delivering of the kingdom and the delivering of the keys. How do you resolve conflicts? This is regarding you and me. Considering that Christ said to the Father, not my will but your will be done. There is conflict in me about going to the cross, but not my will but your will be done. Father, for the son, for the people that are watching, people that are tuned in today and the men that are watching, some of them are sons that are watching, some of them are younger than you, some are older than you. But what would you say to them about resolving conflicts between the will of a son and what that son knows the will of his father is for the son? Well, one, if there is a conflict, a heated conflict, go to another room to calm down before <laughs> you even try to get over it. Uh, that's what I have to do. Um, but two, what helps me get over these types of conflicts is just remembering that I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for him. Um, so for me to be, I guess, disrespectful in a sense, even though everyone's you know, subject to their own opinion, um, I, I always go back to that. I would not be here without my father or my mother. Um, and I don't believe I have a right to come against my father no matter what. So Wow. Wow. You know, wow. even if I think that he's wrong, um, I wouldn't be here today without him. So, which that doesn't happen very often. He doesn't very often think that his dad is wrong. But um, if you were in the room right now, I'm sure you'd be saying, "Mm-hmm." But uh, so you're in this culture today, son. You live in this culture. You have been raised up in a culture, generally speaking, not the not the culture of our house and ministry, but or our home. But you've been raised in a culture. In high school, you went to a public school. Growing up, you were homeschooled. But certainly, when you went into the high school, the public school system, the culture there was everything is about me, 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 me. It's about I'm going to do it my way. I don't need any input from anybody else. My parents had their opportunity. Now it's mine. It was that culture. Considering that and where we're at today and the generation that's growing up with that on their mind, they, it's almost as though there's a generation, again, the fading father. It's not that fathers are fading because they're not there. As long as there's children, they got there because there's a father or daddy. 
so fathers are always going to be there, but they're only fading because it's happening in the minds of the current culture, not because it's happening because people who have their first child suddenly disappear. But in this culture where we're in today, and there's this thing about, hey, they had their chance, now it's mine, I'm going to do what I want, they don't do it like I do it. What would you say about the relevancy of a father-son relationship to someone who came to you and said, I don't need my dad, I don't need my mom, I don't need them, that is a fading fancy, that was a time past, but it isn't relevant today. What would you say to the young people that might be watching that in their mind, for whatever reason, they've come to that thought and that process that just fathering is an, it's irrelevant now. It's not important. They just needed to have me, and now I can take care of myself. Um, let's see. Going back to the selfish nature of you know, this generation, um, I believe there is a time and place for selfishness. Um, but also with an openness to seek guidance from your father or your mother. Um, you can be selfish in a regard that you are set out to do something and nobody else is going to get in your way, but there should never, you should never close the door uh, to the guidance of, of your parents or your father. Um, and whether you think they can teach you something or not, I guarantee you they can, because with age comes wisdom, whether you want to accept that or not. Um, so, I don't know, I guess that's what I would say. That's, that's a good answer. I want to direct our attention to Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to read this this morning, and I want to bring clarification to what this is, especially in relationship to my son's answer he just gave. Um, listening to your parents, no matter what you think, uh, what people might think, first of all, to you that are fathers, I want you to know, or about to be fathers, or one day will be fathers. I want to say to you, never see yourself as a fading fancy. Because even in the minds where you are fading, you still exist and you still are. And you have authority over those that generate. When I use the word authority, I'm not talking about a thumb on somebody. I'm talking about the opportunity to change a life with truth. That's what true authority is. It is an opportunity that we take advantage of to change a life with truth. It's not about squishing and doing all of that, doing all of that. So whether in the minds of some you're a fading father or not, I want to tell you, you never are. You never are. And, and I want to help you understand something. And sons, I want you, in light of what Joshua said just a moment ago, um, never be afraid. Never be afraid. Even if you think your father or your mother might not have it right, listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's wisdom, as he said, that he used that word wisdom. There's wisdom there. And not all wisdom is born out of experience. Wisdom, knowledge is born out of experience. Knowledge is born out of textbooks wisdom is from Holy Spirit wisdom comes by Holy Spirit and the opportunities he gives to us to grow so draw out of that wisdom if you're a son or you're a daughter never be afraid to go to the one who is responsible for you and has authority the ability and the opportunity to change you with truth never be afraid to go to them so with that I want to direct your attention to Ephesians 6 in light of what Joshua said. It says, Fathers, do, this is what it says, and then I'm going to tell you what the original text says. And it's always quoted incorrectly because we include words that did, were not used in the original text. So listen, I'm going to read it the first time as... It's written in your Bible. I'm not opposed to your Bible. Don't get me wrong. Don't get on that train. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying your Bible is an interpretation or a translation so that you could understand it. But some of the words that are included there for you and me, or you and I to understand, were not in the original text. I needed to make that clear. This is what Ephesians 6 says in the English Standard Version, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
That sounds incredible. And I'm about to wrap all this up with these next few statements. But that sounds amazing, and it's quoted so often. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Probably used more by children to their fathers than anyone else. They want to remind every child has memorized Ephesians 6 4. Do not provoke your child to anger. But the problem with that is the those two words, to anger, do not exist in the original text. What the original text reads more like is this. There's two places I want to address in the Greek. First it says, fathers, do not provoke your children. That's it. Then it says, instead, bring them up in the Greek word, Paideia, which means bring them up in disciplined development, protected development, and the instruction of the Lord. Bring them, do not provoke them, but instead bring them up in disciplined development. We provoke, and now let me help you understand what that word provoke means in Ephesians chapter 6. It doesn't mean... I'm making my, don't provoke, don't make my kids mad so they run away from God. Don't make my kids mad so they run away from me. Do not provoke means do not be confusing. It means do not be here and there. Do not be all over the place. Know what truth you're walking in and walk in it because confusion breeds chaos it breeds fear and it breeds doubt and it and it causes children to say if my parents don't know what they believe what am I gonna believe if they don't know which way they're headed where am I headed and he says know where you're going fathers so that your children will know where they're going and then with discipline development guide them along That is powerful. That is powerful. We don't always get it right. But to every father watching today, every son, every man, every person who's ever going to be a father, and you're watching today, even if you're a mom and you're watching today, I'm telling you, this applies to all of of us. Know where you're headed. Know the God in whom you believe. Know that He is for you, rising up, And He is for you, lying down. And I promise you, if you will stay your course, hell or high water, if you will stay your course in the dry season and in the wet season, if you will stay your course on the hottest day and on the coldest day, I am telling you today, your children will follow along in your path. Do not Waver. Do not waver. That is Ephesians 6, 4. That is how Jesus Christ knew, not my will, but your will, Father, be done. Because you have never wavered. You have never provoked me with confusion. You've never made me wonder what you believe. But your yes has always been yes, and your amen has always been been amen son first of all I want to thank you uh, just for being who you are and for agreeing to do this I'm gonna tell you in front of everybody that's watching today in every sense of the word and I could make a long list and we wouldn't have enough paper but you are and have always been a son in whom I'm well pleased did not matter what was what is what happened what didn't happen in all of those moments that you might have been disappointed in yourself and even thought my dad's disappointed in me on the day you thought the worst you were a son and who I was well pleased I've never regretted a moment that you breathed there and I've blessed the day every day that the father has trusted me to be your daddy you are in every sense I can say to you what Yahweh God said about Jesus Christ You are a son in whom I'm well pleased.
And I love you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I really, really, really appreciate it. So let me ask this. Let me wrap it up by asking you these questions. What would you say? And I'm just going to leave it at that. And you can answer that on the Bible app if you followed along today. Those questions are at the bottom of the Bible app. And I would encourage you uh, to answer these questions. And that is, what would you say about how important it is to not only have a father and receive him as a father, but also to know him as a father. That's one. And then two, what is the difference between receiving him and knowing him? How do you know a father? It's one thing to say, that's my father. It's another thing to know that's my father. It's one thing to say, I've received Christ, and completely a different thing to say, I know Christ. It's one thing to have a flesh-deep relationship And another thing, to have a blood-deep relationship. I encourage you today, wherever you are, I encourage you, uh, men, I encourage you, I know there's ladies probably watching too, and I hope all of you are commenting right now on the chat space online. But I encourage you today, know your father. Know your father naturally. If he's still living, know your father naturally. Celebrate the time that you have with him. Know your mother. Celebrate the time that you have with her. Know your heavenly Father. I want to tell you, He wants to know you with everything in Him. He wants to know who you are. If you, for any reason, walked away and you've given up on your relationship with Him, I would ask you again today to revisit who it is that He wants to be in you. Don't just receive Jesus Christ. Know Jesus Christ. Know Him. And the way we get to know Him is because we fellowship with Him and we commune with Him and we talk with Him every single day. It doesn't matter if you pray for an hour a day or if you read three chapters of the Bible every single day. Who really cares? At the end of the day, are you talking to your Lord? Are you talking to your Father? Are you talking to Jesus Christ? Are you letting Holy Spirit really show you what the kingdom looks like? And are you allowing Him? Are you allowing Him? And this is what I'm closing with. Are you allowing Him to prepare you so that one day, He can release to you the keys to the kingdom. I bless you today. I love you. Thank you so much. Amen.